Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this public lecture. Uh, without further ado, I would like to hand over to our Vice Chancellor and Chief Executive, Professor Liz Barnes, CBE DL. Good evening. Thanks so much for joining us to celebrate International Women's Day. It's a pleasure to join you for what I'm sure is going to be an engaging and inspiring lecture from one of our honorary graduates on International Women's Day 2021. The theme of this year's International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge, and few people are more qualified to speak about this topic than tonight's speaker, Olwyn Sylvester. Indeed, when Staffordshire University bestowed the honour of award of honorary doctor upon Alwyn in 2019, it was not only because of the challenges she has had to overcome, carving out a glittering career in a male dominated industry, but also because of the ways in which Alwyn has challenged and continues to challenge the status quo. An Emmy and BAFTA award winning producer, Alwyn has worked across radio, television and film in collaboration with the UK's leading broadcasters and major US networks. With landmark documentaries forefronted by Sir David Attenborough, Channel 4's highly regarded criminal justice show, Trial and Error, and multiple series for the BBC, National Geographic, History, Discovery, and other channels, Alwyn's credits are as extensive as they are impressive. Yet Alwyn's journey didn't begin in London or Manchester or Glasgow or any other UK city renowned for its media sector. In fact, it started just a mile or so north of Staffordshire University's main campus at BBC Radio Stoke. Originally from Hearts Hill, Alwyn's first experience of the broadcast industry came while she was studying for a secretarial qualification at Calden College, now called Stoke-on Trent College. A work experience placement at our local radio station led to a Saturday job answering the phones. And it wasn't long before Alwyn landed a full-time position as a junior secretary in the BBC Director General's office in London. As you've probably guessed, Alwyn wasn't content answering phones. Her desire to break into production drove her to gain experience wherever and whenever an opportunity arose. Between 1979 and 1989, Alwyn worked in almost every BBC department as a production assistant, assistant with credits including EastEnders, Top of the Pops, Rough Justice, Blue Peter, and more. From here, Alwyn became a freelance production manager working on projects for B Sky B and the BBC. And in 1992, she joined forces with several of her former BBC colleagues to become a founder director of Just Television. Here, she production managed all programmes produced by the company, including Channel 4's dispatches. Her work on trial and error, which investigated miscarriages of justice, contributed to the overturning of six wrongful convictions. Just Television won the Royal Television Society Specialist Journalism Award in 1999 and the New York Festival News Investigation Gold World Medal in 2001 in recognition of its challenging documentaries and factual programming. Alwyn became the company's managing director in 2000, taking responsibility for all development, pitching and production activities. Three years later, Alwyn turned freelance again, taking on a series of executive positions at large production companies. In 2007, she met and started working with Sir David Attenborough on programmes such as The Link, Planets in 3D and the 2011 Emmy and BAFTA winning First Life. In 2012, Alwyn joined Bedlam after the major success of its film, The King's Speech. In her current role of managing director and producer, she is responsible for the company's day-to-day -day operations and production output, which has included critically acclaimed films and high-end documentaries for the world's leading broadcasters. This is just a snapshot of what I'm sure we can all agree has been an incredible career. And I think it's safe to say that Alwyn and her colleagues at Bedlam will go on to achieve even greater things in the future. However, when we pray see a person's journey like this, it can have the illusory effect of making each milestone appear as though it followed logically from its antecedent. 
with the benefit of hindsight, it makes perfect sense to us that someone with Olwyn's talent, enthusiasm and determination would go on to become the success that she is today. Summaries like the one I've just delivered can make women's career paths appear straightforward, whereas in reality, they're often anything but. Tonight, Alwyn is going to speak to us about her experiences working in the film and television industry and sector-wide efforts to challenge sexism and, un and unacceptable behaviours that continue to take place both on and off screen. In order to forge her path as a producer, Alwyn has had to overcome many hurdles, but perhaps more importantly, she has helped to dismantle barriers so that her future generations, so future generations can benefit from a gender equal world. If you visit the International Women's Day website, you will see the words, a challenged world is an alert world and from challenge comes change. I'll now hand over to Alwyn so that she can explain why she chooses to challenge. Enjoy the evening and thank you Alwyn for joining us. It's so lovely to see you this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. That was very nice of you. Hello, everyone. It's very nice to be here. So, a Tokyo Olympics chief was recently at the centre of a sexism storm after saying that women talk too much in meetings. When pressed on whether he really thought that women talk too much, he replied, I don't listen to women that much lately, so I don't know. So, if he's accidentally joined us tonight, I should say now, this probably isn't the meeting for you. First of all, happy International Women's Day. Around the world, from small gatherings to local celebrations, through to large scale events and press conferences, people are gathering to celebrate women and to reinforce a commitment to women's equality, rally action and raise awareness. This year's theme is Choose to Challenge, challenging stereotypes, social norms, and what's expected by others. I'm very aware that there are many different challenges to be addressed, but I'm going to talk about what I'm best quali qualified to talk about, and that's my experience in the film and TV industry, and the changes and challenges for women, both in front and behind the camera. This is my view based on my experiences, I can't speak for everyone, I wouldn't want to. And other women may see things entirely differently. But there's no question that as a woman in a male dominated industry, I was sometimes treated differently and not in a good way. I was expected to just put up with pretty poor behavior, put down with language designed to single me out as a woman. And it was all part of the working environment and followed a familiar pattern. If you dared to challenge the behaviour, you could be met with a whole range of responses, ranging from the patronising to ridicule and the threat that if you spoke up, you could be ending your career. Most often, though, there was just a total lack of comprehension about why certain behaviour and language just wasn't acceptable. Thanks to better education, and the fact that there are now more women in senior positions in the workplace, things are gradually improving. But resistance to change continues, and it's not yet a level playing field. And so the fight for true equality continues. I'm very proud to be part of the Choose to Challenge campaign for International Women's Day. Let's start with what we see on screen. When it comes to women on screen, we've made enormous progress, but it comes from a very low bar. From the start, women have struggled to escape being defined by very narrow roles. In 1934, Snow White sang, Someday my prince will come. A pretty virgin, hoping a prince will save her and make her life better. Around about the same time as Snow White was waiting for her prince, Catherine Hepburn was wearing suits, refusing to play the conventional female roles and instead playing strong, independent-minded and often very funny characters in films such as Adam's Rib and Woman of the Year. And she used her power to option film scripts 
and have a say in who got to make them. She was a pioneering powerhouse. And in 1939 came the screen adaptation of the play, The Women, a smart and witty film written by two women and an entirely female cast. There must have been a sense that things were changing for the better. And yet, nearly 50 years later, things had stagnated so much that Goldie Hawn's character in the 1997 film, The First Wives Club, was compelled to say, there are only three ages of women in Hollywood, babe, district attorney, or driving Miss Daisy. Women on screen in dramas were still seen as sex objects, or mothers, or spinsters, or nurturers. They were mainly depicted as being totally dependent on men. Men were cast in roles, and women were cast in relation to them as their wives or their mothers. And in factual television and news, women were barely, vis barely visible. Perhaps it was Snow White who better understood the future. Maybe a prince really was her best option. It's almost as if she'd seen last year's Global Gender Gap report, which revealed none of us will see our lifetimes, and nor likely will many of our children, and that gender parity will not be attained for 99 and a half years. I can hear my goddaughter in Bristol. I'm in London. She's screaming right now. <laughs> How women are seen in film and on TV, and in fact in all media, is incredibly important in the ongoing battle for total equality. In 1988, I worked on a TV comedy series called No Frills, written by Jamie Prager. It was a mainly female cast, and it was produced and directed by Mandy Fletcher. Female directors, especially in comedy, were rare. And Mandy has a really impressive list of credits, including Blackadder, Absolutely Fabulous, the TV and the feature film, and more. I loved working with her. Not only was she very talented and very funny, she was also a great advocate for women in the industry. For No Frills, Mandy insisted on an all-female production team. The crews back then were all male. The point of mentioning this series is because it was about three generations of women, a grandmother, daughter and granddaughter. It was a comedy about a completely normal situation. It just happened that it was about women. One day, I walked into the comedy manager's office where all of the comedies that were in production were listed on a big board at the back of the office. No Frills was just listed as feminist comedy. There's no doubt that we were a proud feminist team, but the very fact that on screen, the story playing out was just about women. It was quite normal, but it was put into the feminist box. It just wasn't the norm, and it felt like code for not being taken seriously. Mandy encouraged us all. She was the first person to offer me a producing job. And looking back at the credits the other day, I remember that there was a young actress in one of the episodes, Amma Asante, now a top Hollywood director. And I've no doubt she was inspired by Mandy too. Cut to 2016, and writer and actress Phoebe Wallabridge brings us the witty, angry, grief-ridden character known only as Fleabag, a totally relatable modern woman. And in one episode of Killing Eve, actress Harriet, Harriet Walter is seen throwing a baby into a bin. Rather shocking, not so relatable, but refreshing. A far cry from the stereotypes and shows women can be badass too. I pity any prince coming to try and rescue her. So female roles in film and TV are continuing to change for the better. And we need to be constantly aware of this when creating characters for drama and when developing ideas for factual, making sure that there's a balance of male and female contributors. A few years ago, my colleagues and I had a story we were developing into a drama TV series. The Mercury 13 
is the true story of the remarkable women who trained for the NASA space program. In 1961, just as NASA launched its first man into space, a group of women underwent secret testing in the hopes of becoming America's first female astronauts. They completed and very often outdid their male counterparts in all of these tests. And yet, in an all too familiar outcome, only the men were chosen to be astronauts. I'd known about this story for a few years. And when a broadcaster became interested, we brought on playwright and TV writer, Rona Munro, to write a treatment about these fantastic women. The treatment had everything needed for a gripping TV series. However, after delivering the treatment to the broadcaster, the message came back. Could we focus the series on the man who trained them? <laughs> this, this was about eight years ago. It was pre Me Too and Time's Up, and the resistance to female-led stories remained as strong as ever. A couple of years ago, I was lucky enough to meet one of the women from the Mercury 13 space program, the brilliantly named Wally Funk. She knew about our efforts to get the story told and how far we got. I said, Wally, I'm sorry, I tried really hard. She just looked me in the eye and simply said, try harder, babe. She was right. In all of these matters, we just have to keep trying harder. Last summer, Mrs. America hit our screens to widespread critical acclaim. For those who haven't seen it, it's an American TV drama based in the 1970s about the political movement to pass the Equal Rights Amendment in the USA and the backlash against it led by conservative activist Phyllis Schlafly. The timing was right for the series. On the back of Me Too and Time's Up movement, broadcasters wised up and began paying attention to female-led stories. And I really appreciated how the series showed women at odds with each other, different agendas, different political beliefs, just as in real life, funnily enough. But it still won't have been easy to finance, and I expect a star cast would have helped. Kate Blanchett not only starred, but she was also an executive producer. I don't know the answer, but I wonder if this series had been pitched 10 years ago, would it have been made? Maybe it was pitched. All I do know is that at the time of being given the green light for production, broadcasters were much more open to female-led stories. Shocking side note is that what the series highlighted was the failure to have the amendment added to the constitution over 40 years ago, and that the Equal Rights Amendment still hasn't been ratified in all states of America. Maybe this year. And now that there's so much more opportunity for female-led stories in drama, there are more opportunities to shine a light on more recent issues too. In 2019, the feature film, Bombshell, featuring Charlize Theron, Nicole Kidman and Margot Robbie, centres on the sexual harassment allegations made against Roger Ailes, the CEO of Fox News. It was based on a true story of the women who eventually exposed Roger Ailes' abuse. These women really did choose to challenge. At the same time as the film, there was also a TV series dealing with the same subject, The Loudest Voice, which was airing on Showtime. And by the way, Amara Santi, who I mentioned earlier, she was one of the directors. So far, I've talked mainly about fiction. Obviously, there's been a huge change and improvement in women's representation in factual TV too. Of course, it still needs to go much further. When I started in TV, there was an expression which would be bandied around. It was the fart and the tart. It was male producer shorthand for on-screen presenting duos. An older male presenter, the old fart, and a younger attractive sidekick and seemingly less important female presenter, the tart. The fart and the tart is what male producers would talk about 
when considering hosts for TV shows. Have a look back at old entertainment programmes and you'll see always an older man and a younger woman. The male presenter always given more prominence on screen. You even saw it in news programmes. Older men, younger women. It was the accepted norm. In 2014, the BBC broke that norm and led the way in giving the UK's biggest entertainment show, Strictly Come Dancing, two female presenters with equal billing, and it was well overdue. It's really disappointing though, when amongst others, former MP Anne Widdicombe, also a former Strictly contestant, questions, why BBC? Why, when Strictly Come Dancing is predicated on teams of men and women, do we have to have two women presenters? Thanks, Anne. A bit of support for the sisters wouldn't have gone amiss there. As another aside, hats off to the producers of this show and also the producers of Dancing on Ice, who also introduced same-sex dancing couples on the shows. wonder how Widdicombe's done for dealing with that one. Panel games have finally caught up too, or at least they're getting there. You only have to go back a few years and see that they were almost entirely made up of male panellists and male hosts. That's definitely changed for the better, although it's come as a bit of a shock to some of the comedy dinosaurs to discover women really are funny. And if you watch factual TV and news programmes, there's still a very obvious imbalance between the men and the women. In the main, the women are more groomed, younger, slimmer, and when they're not, it's their appearance that gets talked about, criticised. How often do you hear that about a male presenter? He's looking a bit chunkier. He should dye his hair. What we're still not seeing enough of is older women on screen, whether that's in drama or in factual. Mary Beard, Professor of Classics at the University of Cambridge, renowned historian and TV presenter, is 66 years old. I mention her age just because it's relevant. Dr. David Starkey is 76. Professor Simon Sharma is 78. I don't believe I've seen an article or interview about either men where their age is discussed as an issue. Or come to that, their hair, or their clothes, or their general appearance. And yet, Mary Beard receives unbelievably vile comments about how she looks, not just from internet trolls with nothing better to do, but from TV critics too. In 2012, one male critic felt that she should be kept away from cameras altogether. Mary Beard's response? There have always been men who are frightened of smart, smart women who speak their minds. She said, the point is not what I look like, but what I do. She's called a witch whenever she says something that other people don't like, told to get back to her cauldron. Much of this takes place on social media, which, for all of its positives, can be a hiding place for cowards and misogynists. But what is it people, I suspect mainly men, don't like about these older women? What's the threat they feel? It must be something terrifying. I ask because I don't know, and I don't expect you to know the answer either. But we need to see more older women on the TV. Just imagine for a moment, if we treated men the same way, the wonderful being that is David Attenborough would have been taken off our screens over 55 years ago when he reached the age of 40. And if any of you are enjoying watching the French series, Call My Agent, a recent episode had Sigourney Weaver playing herself as an actress who'd been cast in a romantic film alongside an actor of her own age, round about 70. And in the episode, Weaver said that she wanted to play against a younger man. It was great to see this episode play out, seeing the fictional male characters just not wanting to accept that an older woman and younger man could be possible. The fictional producers and distributors backed away from giving any support to the older woman character who was stepping outside of her older woman box. She won the day, of course, 
obviously, it's Sigourney Weaver. Sometime before lockdown, I was walking down Bond Street and outside a cosmetics shop, a man stepped forward and offered me a promotional offer of an eye cream. He said it would get rid of all the fine lines around my eyes. I usually just walk by, but this particular morning, I thought I'd set him straight. I asked him what he thought I should, why I should try to get rid of those lines. I explained, I'm 59, I've lived a life. Those lines represent that life. What exactly is wrong with looking older? I felt a bit sorry for him, actually. He was just doing his job. He was just trying to make a living. But the fact is, the pressure for women is to look young. And this is especially true for women under the magnifying glass of a giant screen or even high definition television. The pressure to appear youthful, be under 35 or at least try to look under 35. And we must reflect on screen much more accurately what women look like and are like. So behind the screen, we need far more women developing stories, writing, producing, directing. And on the technical side, the number of women on the cruise lags way behind the men. Last year, a friend of mine was on a judging panel for best drama director. And out of 52 entries, 48 of the films were directed by men. One of the biggest barriers to women's success is money. We talk about the film industry and the TV business, and that's right, it's a business. Now, think about needing to get something done in your home. Who do you call? I'd like to say the female cast of Ghostbusters, but no. You call a professional who knows what they're doing in your home. Someone who's done this job before, someone with experience, you give them money for what you're pretty sure is going to be a good job. But that's what happens in film and TV. You develop an idea, and it may be brilliant, but the financiers, be that in film or TV, want to know that it's going to at least get its money back and hopes that it'll make even more. It's a business, not a charity. So mitigating risk is the thing for financiers. Known writers, directors, producers, who have a track record of delivering their product, projects, they have a head start. And it's the same with heads of departments on the crew. They're there because their experience and ability to deliver, which is what the producers need. So if the majority of those roles are currently taken by men, how do we change it? How do we introduce the balance? The men at the top of their game have had time to get there, learn their craft and get their deserved success. How do we do that for women? Amongst other things, we need broadcasters to commit to equality and put their money where their mouth is with training and opportunity across all sectors of the industry. For example, women are currently massively underrepresented on crews. BT Sport and ITV are supporting the Rise Up Mentoring Programme, which is specifically for women entering the technical side of the business. The BBC has laid out its plans to make the necessary changes to reach their 50% female target. But big old institutions take time to change. And it's difficult to change the way it's always been. Newer organisations can start the way they mean to go on. So when Netflix set up, there was no doubt that the organisation would be set up with gender balance rolled out across the whole organisation. And Netflix has introduced a fund for creative equity, $100 million, a fund focused on building talent pipelines for underrepresented communities. Talent pipelines, I'm sorry, that's terrible. I wish I hadn't said talent pipelines. But this is all good and we need more. But we have to watch out for those who just pay lip service to the cause. But with that lies another balance, one between work and life. Or is that just a woman's problem? Many women have been asked the question about balancing work and family, sometimes as if it only applies to them. On one occasion, the presenter asked me if I'd work on his next TV series. 
It involved foreign travel and being away from home for about a month. The owner of the production company I was working for at the time said, without any kind of self-awareness, well, of course, Alwyn, you won't want to go because you have a family. I pointed out that the majority of the crew were men who also had families. Would he be asking them the same question? No, of course not. Recently, I saw George Clooney being interviewed, during which he talked about his children. And I wondered if anyone would be saying, hey, George, I don't suppose you want to go away anymore. Not, not now you've got a young family. When my son was young, on the rare occasion that I had to leave work to collect him or to take him to an appointment, I found it was just easier to lie about what I was doing. To say I was leaving on a child-related issue I absolutely knew would be held against me. Men generally were seen as good dads if they occasionally left early to see their kids before bedtime. When I joined Bedlam, I explained to the owners, Simon and Gareth, occasionally I have to leave work bang on time to collect my son. And without hesitation, they said, well, why don't you work from home on those days? Make life easier. Not everyone gets that kind of support. We really need to change attitudes towards childcare and caring in general. Too many women find it near impossible to get back into the industry after taking time out to have a baby. We will continue to have an imbalance if we don't address this, economically and practically. And it's being done, for example, the organisation Raising Films was set up five years ago by a group of filmmakers who felt they had no help on how to manage being a parent and maintain careers as filmmakers. And they remain at the forefront of the campaign to recognise all aspects of caring for others while at the same time making a living. Again, it's back to the economics, one of the biggest barriers facing women. If finances alone prevent women from pursuing a career and being a parent, then a vital voice is missing from society. One of the positives of the past year, I think, has been to demonstrate that if really necessary and on occasion, it is possible to work from home. Some flexibility has to be a good thing for workers who are also carers. And once inside an organisation, the work goes on. There continues to be a huge amount of sexist behaviour. I've had to put up with my fair share of sexist crap over the years. Some I've been able to challenge, some not. Once a head of department told me not to be too ambitious as it can lead to disappointment for a woman. Mm -hmm. Another told me he'd like me to join his department because I looked good, mm -hmm. what, like an ornament. <laughs> a much loved family entertainer who was a big star in his day would pinch my bottom. My response was to tell him very firmly not to do that. He, in return, would draw attention to it with everyone around, usually in the green room, surrounded by other professionals and studio contributors, trying to embarrass me, which wasn't too difficult in those days, and making me aware that there was a price to pay for choosing to challenge. Recently, I was chatting with an old friend about when we started in the industry. I said I thought that we'd been, that we'd been lucky, for want of a better word, and that the sexism we'd had to put up with in the early days was nowhere near as bad as some of the stories that had begun to surface as the Me Too movements gathered momentum. She went quiet for a moment before going on to tell me of the sexual abuse she'd suffered from one senior male colleague. I asked her why she hadn't told me about it at the time. And she said, what was the point? Who could we have gone to? The cold reality was everyone we could have reported it to were men and they were all friends in and out of work. We wouldn't have stood a chance. It's evident even now that this behaviour still continues. I talked to a young producer recently who told me about when she first joined the industry about 10 years ago. 
As is normal, her name and mobile number were on the daily call sheet for location. She started to receive friendly and then increasingly sexually explicit text messages from an actor on the shoot. She took the problem to her line manager, who informed the actor's agent. And his response? He called the woman receiving the text to ask if she'd been encouraging them. It's very frustrating. And it remains incredibly hard, an incredibly hard thing to do, reporting inappropriate behaviour from whatever level. But I take heart from the recent evolving changes in attitudes, so that today it feels fractionally less daunting and there's less chance of not being believed. There's always more to do, but now there is real help for those who need it. Everyone deserves to feel safe at work, everyone. A relatively new and much welcomed role on set is that of the intimacy coordinator. So if, for example, you were filming a fight, you'd hire a fight coordinator to be on set, to plan the scene and keep everyone safe, but maintaining authenticity. An intimacy coordinator performs precisely that same function, an expert working through an intimate scene with the actors to make sure it feels natural and everyone is comfortable with it. It all comes down to safety and, and consent. There are now guidelines for the protection of artists involved in sex scenes on film and to help directors and crew deal safely and comfortably with scenes that include sexual content. Kira Knightley, a powerful voice in the industry, announced that she will no longer be directed in sex scenes by men. She is choosing to challenge and it will make a difference. It's slowly changing but production can still often be very macho, working long hours, being first in and last out are often seen as signs of commitment. The implication being, if you don't, you're lazier, less committed, replaceable, and in such environments, a culture of bad behavior can thrive. We're all now much more aware of what is and isn't acceptable, and most workplaces have protocols for challenging bad behavior, but I understand why it can still be difficult to challenge, especially for younger, newer people in the industry. And in a freelance world, the fear of not getting the next contract looms large. Nobody bullies the boss, so they don't always see such behaviour. It can be all too easy to assume that your team is trouble free if no one tells you about it. So we have to be on the lookout for each other. We have to back the quiet kid, listen to the annoying show off, stick together the safety in numbers. Progress isn't linear. It comes in fits and starts. Sometimes it goes backwards before it goes forwards. But with persistence and some courage, it cannot be denied. I've been encouraged by some great women in the industry, Mandy Fletcher. Also at the BBC early in my career, Jane Lush. She gave me a researcher job. I was worried I wouldn't get the job because I didn't have a degree or even A-levels. But Jane interviewed me, thought I could do the job, gave me the job, straightforward stuff. And right at the start, the first women I met in the industry at Radio Stoke, Janet Walker and Sandra Chalmers, who encouraged me to apply for a job at the BBC. A young woman, uncertain of my qualities or what my life might hold for me outside of my own hometown. I needed that little push. And so, wherever I can, and in honour of those women who believes in me, I try to pay it forward and help and encourage other women coming through. I'm so inspired by the women I meet in the industry. At Bedlam, we're working with smart, clever, funny, dynamic women from Brazil to Beirut, hello Maya, <laughs> from South End to Saudi, London to LA. There's no shortage of women on our projects. And that's also because I have a business partner in Simon Egan and we share a vision. Our experience in the industry depends so much on who we work with. And there are lots of good men like Simon who really support and encourage women. The rise of women isn't about the downfall of men, 
although some still believe it is. Equality benefits us all. So, have we made progress? Yes, lots. I think it would have been harder for me to have said that with as much conviction, perhaps 10 years ago, and certainly 20. The Me Too and Time's Up movement have struck a chord. This is, of course, about rights, equality, but also, more broadly, justice. I sense a mood throughout the industry. Complacency is being challenged. Poor behaviour is being challenged. Attitudes, seemingly cast in stone, are being challenged. Change isn't easy, but it's coming, and it is exciting. Film and TV is a great industry, and I would encourage anyone who wants to work in it to do so. The range of skills required across the, uh, the industry is enormous. Just look at all the different credits on the back of a feature film. We just have to keep challenging to make sure we soon see gender equality across all of those credits. I have a favourite quote from American politician and diplomat Madeleine Albright, which I think sums up this year's theme. She said, it took me quite a long time to develop a voice, and now that I have it, I am not going to be silent. It's a privilege to be sharing International Women's Day with you, and when future generations look back at this time in history, they will see, I'm certain, that we all choose to challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alwyn. It was an excellent lecture. Um, we had some questions submitted in advance. Um, if you, if I may start with the first one. Yes, thank you. Do you feel there are still barriers to women entering the industry in technical roles? No, no. Um, there may be some bad attitudes still with people who've maybe been in the roles for a long time and see it as um, a male area. But no, we should be encouraging more women, uh, most definitely in the technical areas. Um, BT Sport and ITV, who I mentioned earlier, are running a scheme to uh, encourage women and train women. Um, we need more trainees on set. The last time I set up a shoot, um, every department had a trainee and it was really good to see that the trainees in the camera departments and in the technical areas were all women. So, no, we need to encourage more women to do. It would make a huge difference if we had more women in the technical departments. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what the best protocol is for people who are being made to feel uncomfortable or receiving harassment on set? where there's no HR support? What is the best way to report it or get support without compromising their job? Um, I'd like to think there are always protocols in place, but um, I appreciate sometimes it's difficult. Um, I think you always have to share with somebody uh, you have to share your story and what's going on with someone else as much as anything as a witness to what's going on. I would suggest you go to your line manager. If you can't go to a line manager, go to somebody else within the group that you trust because they can then help you. <clears throat> or you go to an organisation such as Bechtu or Women in Film and Television or another senior person in the industry if you know them. A um, couple of years ago, I had someone come to me who uh, we'd worked together in a team and she'd gone to work in, a, in another company. And there was somebody there who was undermining her. She was a very good production manager, but she was being undermined and a little bit bullied all the time. And she came to me because she didn't have anyone to go to or anyone who she thought would listen. And we worked out together what was most comfortable for her so that she could sit down with that producer and explain what the producer's behavior was making her feel like. What was interesting on this occasion was 
the behavior, the bullying behavior was coming from a woman. And she'd grown up in an environment where she was copying the behavior that she'd seen. And she was totally shocked to have this pointed out to her. And the two of them, she and the production manager, were able to talk it through and find a better way of working together. So I think in answer to your question, there's always somebody that you can go to, an organization, but always find somebody to share it with, to help you initially, even if that's only finding somebody else that you can go and talk to. Thank you, and thank you for sharing this example. Um, the next question is, are there any mentor schemes you could recommend for aspiring film professionals or best ways of acquiring a mentor in your chosen field? Um, there are lots of mentoring schemes. Uh, women in film and television have a brilliant mentoring scheme. I'm sure it's completely oversubscribed, but you should definitely look there. Um, screen skills, you should look at their website. They, they run so many programs. Uh, I think they have a mentoring scheme as well. Uh, broadcasters, big organizations. So I think you know, do your homework around the organizations um, and what there is. I think universities usually look for mentor mentors. Um, I've mentored. In fact, I was mentoring a woman 18 months ago and it was supposed to be for six months. And we carried on because actually I learn as much from her as she does from me. So um, I think you just have to keep trying with different organizations, production companies, broadcasters. Um, yeah, yeah. But Women in Film and Television is a, is a brilliant one. Thank you. Um, do you think attitudes differ in different genres of production? Um, I know that they used to. So uh, I don't know so much about now. I think it's probably better now. So, for example, in the 90s, I was offered a job in sport, quite a senior job in sport, and I said no, because my experience of sport was, it was, it was very sexist, it was all men, and I just wasn't going to go there. You know, you have to choose your fights, and I was, I was too exhausted for that one at that time. I think sport is very different now. In fact, I think the head of sport at the BBC is a woman. Um, I think most departments um, are much more open um, than they used to be. I, I, I don't think it. I don't think it varies that much. Um, no, no, I don't. Not now. Thank you. Um, the next two questions are quite similar. Um, what is the most effective way we can combat sexism in this industry? And what has been the most effective method to combat sexism in your experience? Right, okay. Well, generally in the industry, um, do what we're doing, challenge. You know, it's fantastic. I think today the, um, the coverage for International Women's Day has been bigger than ever. It's brilliant. And I think the more noise we make, the more we challenge, the more the voices that want to you know, behave in a sexist way, they'll become quieter. Because even if they fear this, they won't dare say it after a while. So keep doing what we're doing, keep challenging. Um, I think that, you know, I think maybe big organisations, the BBC, um, ITV, setting targets, make, and then being held to account, that's very important. I don't particularly believe in quotas, but I think targets with time scales and being held to account is very important. So I think that's generally, um, I think for me personally, the way I've combated um, sexism varies. So it depends what it is. So quite often you can have just little quips, little remarks and depending on who it is, sometimes I can just bat it back, turn it back around on the person, or use humour. Because as we know, some men don't think women are funny, but we are. Um, so use humour. Um, or, you know, on one occasion, I used a lawyer. So it depends what you're up against. And it's, 
and it's if you have difficulty trying to combat something yourself again tell somebody else and they can try and do it for you you know if there's behavior that's going on I once had somebody come to me who was having a problem like this and didn't feel in a position to be able to fight back themselves so they came to me I took that as an anonymous complaint and then took it to the person and talked to them so I think there's so many different ways but if you get stuck you talk to somebody and then try and find a way together hope that answers it in <laughs> some way thank you yes it, it did um the next question is uh, about script what do you look for okay. in a script when deciding whether you would like to join the project as the producer oh okay um so we look for lots of things so as a um you know a small company everything you develop you're doing on your own dime no one's paying you to do that it's not very often anyway unless it's a jointly owned project and someone else is paying you so you've got to really love the script you've got to really love the script or the idea anyway it's got to so for me it's got to be something that i can read and i can relate to it in some way so we have several projects on the go and Simon and I go through them and we check in every so often that we we care about these projects and that we think we can get them made so in terms of relatable stories um so for example there's one story uh, that we're creating and developing at the moment with a writer called Georgia Fitch and it's about women of a certain age and it's funny and that's totally relatable we are working on another script with writer Austin Collins and that has an alien now it's still relatable i mean who do thought so it's got to be something that you really enjoy because you're going to put a lot of unpaid time into developing so that's one thing you look at the status of the project you know is it just the germ of an idea or is it a fantastic script ready to go out to lead actors So that will give you an idea of how much time and money you need to spend on that project. And then you have to think about does it fit into the climate at the moment? So going back to the Mercury 13 was brilliant. But you know, we didn't make it because at that time nobody wanted a series about women. It didn't matter how fantastic they were, they didn't want it at that time. So you think about does it fit into the climate now? can you get it financed you know there's no point um i say there's no point it would be extremely difficult to have new writer new director new actor going in trying to raise 25 million on a script it's just not feasible so you have to match it's that thing about mitigating risk again so you have to work out how much the script is going to cost to get made and is it going to get back but right back to the beginning it's got to be an idea that we that we love to start with thank you um the next question is about networking how do you go about establishing a network in your industry um well i didn't have one when i joined the bbc um so you start small and you grow so all of your students you have a network you're all together you're all training and you'll stay in touch hopefully when you finish your courses and you'll go off to different jobs and if you form a group you kind of go well they've gone there they've gone there and you get information and you build out that way i'd suggest um joining groups so if you can if you can afford it join for example women in film and tele or create your own group um if you can join um a professional development group i joined a professional development group 8 years ago and it was uh it was run by the brilliant harriet spicer and kathy gale and we were eight women who came together once a fortnight not from this industry from all different industries but we came together because actually the sort of things that we face 
as women in any industry, it's quite often the same. Um, and that was a brilliant group for, apart from anything, giving me confidence to be here today. So I think join groups, um, go to as many events as you can that are happening in your area. And I know they're happening. I know the events that happen in Stoke-on-Trent, the platform events, the university events, and try and talk to one person at least and get their details and stay in touch. So it's common sense really, but you just kind of start small and you keep building and you stay in touch and hopefully that works. Uh, thank you. And last question. How often would you attend film festivals, markets, or the like, both before and during your career? Oh, um, I don't know the answer to that because I think it's different for everyone. For me, I've only been to Cannes twice and they were two very different experiences. So the first time I was going to Cannes, um, it was with a script which was going to be directed by Susan Seidelman and it had Jada Pinkett attached as the female lead. And I went there with no money. We just had the script and Jada and Susan. And I went with two other producers and all we could afford between us was a, a single room. So we had a rotor for who could sleep which hours. Um, and it was, to be honest, it was a fairly miserable experience because we hadn't got any finance attached to the script at that point. So we were there trying to see people and we got to see some people, but not many. I went back the following year and we had 90% of the finance in place on that film. And it was a very different experience. We were being invited in for meetings. We were being invited to the parties. So I think it depends why you want to go. If you're going because you're trying to close finance, then that's a good idea because you're going to have everyone in the same place and it's a good focused time. If you're going just to kind of hang out and try and meet people, it's an interesting experience if that's what you want to do, but you don't just get through the door. People are most likely to respond to you when you've got something that they want. So, you know, but having said that, you know, all being well, we'll be with a project at Cannes this year in July. Um, I haven't been to the Berlin Festival. I'd love to. There's so many festivals, but that's been my experience. So I'm probably not the best person because I haven't been to so many festivals. Thank you very much, Alwyn. Uh, thank you very much for this lecture. It's, it's been amazing to hear your stories. Thank you for sharing them. Um, to all you watching, you can find out more about our events or watch them on demand at staffs.ac.uk forward slash events. Once again, thank you, Alwyn, and I wish everybody a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you.